All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will continue to join uh, and connect in to the webinar. I'd like to welcome everybody, um, whether it's the morning or the afternoon um, on this Monday, to our international webinar on the length of child pretrial detention. We're really excited that you're able to join us. And uh, just a couple housekeeping items before we, before we uh, get into the meat of the webinar. First, uh, I'd like to thank all the people who helped put the webinar together, but specifically the Pretrial Justice Institute. Um, the Pretrial Justice Institute is actually hosting the webinar and helping us on the technical side to, to pull this off. A couple other housekeeping items, uh, if you want to go ahead and go to the next, to the next slide there, Beth. Um, we'll be recording the webinar today and making the link available to everybody so you can share, uh, share the webinar if you're not able to join us for the entire time. I will also be sending out an email link to some of the reports and other materials like the PowerPoint that we'll be sharing in the webinar today. Uh, and finally, we're going to try to reserve about the last 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A. If you look at your webinar, um, the Zoom application, there's a chat box down at the bottom. And the chat box is how you can go ahead and submit uh, questions. We'll just save those questions up until the end. Uh, if you want to send those chat box questions either to me directly or you can send them to the whole panel, uh, but make sure that uh, make sure that they're you're specific about who you're sending those to so that we can see the chat, uh, the questions that you're asking. So with that, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our panelists. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Beth. Yep. First, we're really excited to have this panel, be able to put this panel together. Uh, it's a great, it's a really great group. Uh, we have Bart Lubau, who is the former uh, director of the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Juvenile Justice Strategy Group and the founder of the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, uh, which currently has over 300 sites or counties across the United States where they've been working uh, and seeing significant reductions in the use of detention and secure confinement for children in the United States where they're working. In 2017, Bart uh, authored the Casey Foundation's report called Timely Justice, Improving JDI, JDI Results Through Case Processing Reforms, designed to help their JDI sites refocus their efforts um, to reduce the time that children spend in detention awaiting, uh, awaiting trial or awaiting adjudication. We also have uh, Yannick uh, Vandenberg. He is the Assistant Professor of Child Law and Criminal Law at the Department of Child Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and currently the Visiting Scholar at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Yannick has published numerous articles on child rights and child pretrial detention, and specifically focused on just on the Dutch juvenile justice system, and uh, bringing his perspective also as a judge. He's currently a deputy judge in the juvenile court of the Hague. Hey, Doug. County in Tennessee in the United States. Uh, she's been part of the local JDAI site team working to promote alternatives to detention uh, in her jurisdiction. And she's also participated in the JDAI case processing group of practice designed to further K the Casey Foundation's work to reduce the length of stay or the length of time that children spend in detention. And I am uh, Douglas Keeler. I'm the founder and director of Juvenile Justice Advocates International. We work with local governments to uh, re reduce the use and, and the duration of detention in the juvenile justice system. Our pilot sites are in Mexico, and we're currently expanding to other countries in Latin America. And I'll share with you a little bit later uh, the report that we published last year on, on this topic. So before I hand it over to the rest of the panelists, I just wanted to share why we all felt like this was such an important topic to be, uh, to be uh, conducting this webinar. You can go ahead to the next slide, Beth. Um, in our case, specifically in our work, um, when we started our pilot project in Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, children were spending an average of 190 days in detention awaiting trial. And over two thirds of those children were receiving either diversion or probation once they were uh, had their cases resolved. Uh, we were finding that plea bargains and diversion were actually doing nothing to reduce the amount of time that children were spending in detention. Um, we brought these issues to the court and, and started wanted to try to work on reducing the length that children spend in pretrial detention. 
Um, but it was a very difficult, uh, it was very difficult to convince specifically the judges of, of the need to do this. Around the world, uh, people in pretrial detention are subject to abuse, torture, uh, mistreatment, and specifically children are, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, in countries that lack adequate facilities, adequate food, sanitation, um, having inadequate services or access to things like education and training um, and other services, pretrial detention can be specifically traumatic for children. Uh, research indicates that pretrial detention can double the risk of depression and suicide in teenagers, uh, double uh, the amount of school dropouts, uh, double the rate of uh, substance abuse once they're released from detention. And even in jurisdictions that have successfully implemented alternatives to detention, we're still finding that children spend a, a very long time in detention before those alternatives are put into place or activated for them. So we're hosting this webinar specifically because we believe that this critical issue of how long children spend in pretrial detention has been, um, has been overlooked in most parts of the world and in the international community. And so we wanted to bring together this very impressive group of panelists to talk about, to talk about these issues. Um, quick kind of a roadmap or agenda for where we're going today. First, we're gonna have uh, Yannick explain some of the legal framework and principles around uh, the issues that we're discussing from an international perspective. Uh, we're gonna provide an overview of the global study that we conducted on the, on the length of pretrial detention in 180 countries around the world. And then we'll have a couple of case studies from the U.S. and Nether the Netherlands uh, presented on, on these specific issues before we get back to our question and answer. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to, to Yannick to uh, explain some of the legal framework that we're working with. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Doug. Uh, yes, in this section, I will briefly present uh, some of the key international children's rights uh, principles and standards uh, regarding pretrial detention uh, of children. Um, but before doing so, uh, next slide, please, Beth. Uh, before uh, doing so, it's important to emphasize that pretrial detention of children is truly a global uh, issue of concern and has also been recognized as a global uh, issue of concern by several international bodies. Uh, for example, in, in 2007, uh, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child notes with concern that in many countries, uh, children in pretrial attention, children languish in pretrial attention for months or, or even years. Uh, moreover, um, uh, the, the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture in 2015 uh, emphasized that worldwide the vast majority of children deprived of liberty in juvenile justice systems is held in pretrial detention. Um, well, this, in, these, these concerns, these practices impose an apparent tension with some of the key international children's rights principles and standards. Most importantly, laid down in the United Nations uh, Convention uh, on the Rights of the Child. Uh, well, this is a almost universally uh, ratified a treaty, uh, legally binding to, to states' parties. And particularly, Article 37b of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is important, as it explicitly emphasizes that a deprivation of liberty, including pretrial attention, uh, should be used only in a lawful and non-arbitrary uh, manner. Uh, and lawful means that pretrial attention of children should have a clear basis in the formal law, both the procedure and the substantive grounds, and should be in, in accordance with international uh, legal principles. Moreover, pretrial attention shall not be arbitrary, which means that pretrial attention of children may not be manifestly unjust, uh, unpredictable, or uh, disproportionate. Secondly, um, it's basically the second limb of Article 37b, is that pretrial attention shall be used only as a measure of last resort and for the shortest appropriate period of time. And according to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, it should even be used only as uh, uh, for the shortest possible period. Finally, uh, pretrial attention cannot be used to anticipate a custodial sentence, as this would violate the presumption of innocence, which is also uh, uh, explicitly laid down in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And for the audience from uh, the United States uh, for today, it's important, uh, although the US has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, these principles 
are still relevant as similar principles are embraced in virtual, uh, virtually all uh, states' uh, laws. So this is still relevant also for the US audience. Uh, next slide. Then. Well, the United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child provides recommendations to states' parties as to how uh, these standards, these principles can be implemented in an effective manner. Uh, and they do so in general comment number 10 uh, on juvenile justice and children's rights, which is currently under revision and is soon to be replaced by general comment number 24. There's now a draft version uh, published uh, online at the moment. Um, well, the UN committee urges states to develop alternatives to pre-child attention uh, of children, Non-custodial measures such as uh, training programs, curfew, restraining orders, everything that's necessary to prevent the use of uh, pretrial detention. Secondly, um, the, the, the committee recommends states to implement strict time limits for pretrial detention. Uh, more concre concretely, they, they recommend states to make sure that arrested children are be brought before a judge uh, to, to be able to assess or challenge the legality of pretrial detention within 24 hours after the arrest. Um, they recommend states to, to safeguard that children of pretrial detention are brought before a court within 30 days and that final verdict uh, will be there within a maximum of six months. And in the meantime, the legality of the pretrial detention should be reviewed on a regular basis, preferably every two weeks. And in the new general comment, draft version, um, the, the, the committee even recommends a weekly assessment of the legality of pretrial detention. And finally, uh, the committee is very clear that children in pretrial detention should be released as soon as possible, if necessary, under conditions. Next slide, please. Well, implementing this notion that pretrial detention, this principle of pretrial detention, should, as, uh, should be as short as possible. Uh, can be quite challenging in practice. There are some difficulties that I would like to, to address uh, in, in, in this part of the, the presentation. First of all, the possible tension between uh, a speedy trial versus a thorough investigation and a fair procedure. It's very important that pursuing a speedy, speedy trial does not come at cost of a thorough investigation uh, and a fair procedure because apparently, or, or it's very clear that, that a fair trial is also a fundamental uh, children's right. Children's right. Um, secondly, uh, case processing involves many different stakeholders in practice, which means that reforming this practice also requires involvement of many different stakeholders, which, ma which makes it, or can make it more complicated. I'm sure my, my American colleagues will address this issue as well, but it is a complexity in, in practice. Finally, it's important to emphasize that pretrial detention decisions as such are very, can be very complex and delicate uh, decisions. Um, I've studied this decision for, for a few years in my research and now as a deputy judge I'm also, I, I have to make these decisions uh, every now and then and those can be very hard uh, decisions. Um, next uh, slide, uh, Matt. Um, those decisions can be hard because it requires the balancing of divergent interests at stake. At a criminal justice or public safety uh, interest, which might require pretrial attention if there is a high risk of reoffending, if uh, it's necessary to safeguard uh, the juvenile's appearance in court. But at the same time, you have to balance or take into account uh, the personal liberty interest of the child. Uh, that he can stay with his family, uh, remain going to school, fair trial interest, including the presumption of innocence. But also, and some judges find this very important, uh, the idea of pretrial detention as an early intervention to impose a quick intervention, which is, according to some judges, more effective than if you wait uh, longer. And pretrial detention can be an instrument to do so. And of course, in this balancing exercise, the best interest of the child should always be a primary consideration according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But if you ask judges what is in the child's best interest, you can get slightly different answers. Some search the meaning of best interest primarily in the personal liberty interest, in the fair trial interest, but others see these, the, the early intervention as truly uh, serving the child's needs. So it's a complex uh, decision to make. Uh, next slide, uh, Beth. 
Nevertheless, judges and all other practitioners are bound by the core uh, children's rights principles laid down in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, legally binding principles. So judges should make sure that pretrial attention decisions are always lawful, never arbitrary, that pretrial attention is used only as a last resort for the shortest possible period, and that pretrial attention is not used to anticipate a sentence. And it's an obligation, a legal obligation for all state parties to do whatever it, it, it takes to effectively implement these principles uh, in, in, in their jurisdiction, which requires uh, implementation efforts on multiple levels, uh, on the level of legislation, for example, uh, narrow grounds for pretrial attention in the law, time limits in the law, policy uh, strategies, uh, including uh, the development of, of non-custodial uh, measures, uh, alternatives to detention, and of course, our also practices uh, should be uh, uh, reformed to, to, to implement this, uh, including, for example, the training of judges and decision makers on how to use pretrial attention as a last resort and for the shortest possible period. Um, now I'm going to give the floor back to Doug as he will present the key findings of his uh, global survey on pretrial attention limits. Thanks. Great. Great, thank you, Yannick. Um, just a quick reminder for anyone that would like to ask any questions for the group, you can use the chat feature to do that. Uh, last year, our organization, in conjunction with the University of Minnesota and the American University, published a Children in Pretrial Detention, Promoting Stronger International Time Limits, which was a survey of 118 countries' uh, statutory limits on pretrial detention. So our study didn't specific, wasn't able to look at how long children are actually spending in pretrial detention, but rather it was a survey of statutes and court rules across, uh, across the globe. A couple of key findings I'd like to share with you, and then we can also share a link to the full report um, after the webinar for, for all the attendees. Uh, first of all, uh, you can see here, of the countries that we surveyed, about 26% of those countries had no specific statutory limit for how long children could spend in pretrial detention. So those countries are in black on the map. But 43% of the countries we surveyed had a child-specific limit. So they either had a, a juvenile court rule or a juvenile uh, justice or, or youth justice statute that was specifically applicable to children and had a specific time limit. And then 31% of the countries that we surveyed did have a time limit, but it was a generally applicable time limit or one that applied to in both the adult and the juvenile system. Um, so it kind of gives you the breakdown uh, of, of the countries that we were able to collect data from of how those broke down. I'm going to go to the next slide. In, in specifically, most countries have kind of two different types of uh, limits. So there's a, what we call the base limit, or how long the statute provides a child can be in pretrial detention uh, while their case is pending. And then uh, many countries also have sort of extensions or exceptions to that time limit. And in the cases where those, those exceptions have their own, have, a, have an additional time limit, you can see the average of those two limits here on the chart. So of all the 118 countries that surveyed, 121 days was the average uh, base time limit. And then for countries that allowed exceptions or extensions, the average extended out to 332 days. Um, if you go to, go ahead and go to the next slide. So breaking that down by the countries that either had child-specific limits or these generally applicable or, or limits that were used in both the adult system and, um, and the juvenile system, you can see the breakdown of how long, on average, those country statutes allowed children to be detained awaiting trial. So clearly, countries that had juvenile-specific limits uh, had an average of 93 days for their base limit or just over three months, um, whereas countries that had, a, a, using the limit from the adult system, it was an average of 160 days or almost um, just over five, between five and six months. So if you can go ahead to the, to the next slide. Uh, the, other, the other than uh, thing that we looked at was countries that had what we're calling a base limit, but they had offered no exceptions. So versus countries that did have exceptions. So for example, um, many jurisdictions in the, in the United States will have a 30 or 60 day a time limit for juvenile pretrial detention, but then we'll allow exceptions. Often it's an exception based on a showing of just cause. Um, other countries have other types of exceptions. Whereas some countries like Mexico, for example, has a five month uh, pretrial detention limit and they have no exceptions. 
So uh, children cannot be detained longer than five months in Mexico, irregardless of, of any other circumstances. So here we can see the countries that do have exceptions or allow extensions, the base limit ends up being much, much shorter. And you can see that this is potentially one way that countries are balancing some of those different, um, those different competing concerns that Yannick was discussing by having kind of a, a base limit or a, a standard limit, but then allowing exceptions to that in cases where it's particularly, particularly complicated cases or cases that require more time to resolve. Um, and so then the next, the next slide, we'll see the breakdown of what this looks like uh, on the map again. So here we have countries that have no limit are in black, and then countries that have a base limit of under six months, which is the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child recommendation, are in various shades of blue, and then countries that have longer than six months would be in orange. And so that kind of gives you a, an idea of what countries, what regions of the world, um, even kind of what you can, you can get an idea of what sorts of legal systems um, and, and this shows that basically it tends to be a global problem. It's not concentrated in any one area or civil law versus common law countries or uh, countries that have a mixed Sharia law tradition, for example. It's basically something that we're seeing issues around the globe. If we go to the next slide then, we'll look at the countries that have uh, allow unlimited, essentially unlimited exceptions are in black versus countries that allow exceptions but have a very strict time limit on how long those exceptions or extensions are allowed for. So again, countries in, in shades of orange are extend past the six months that the Committee on the Rights of the Child recommends versus those that are in uh, shades of blue. About 40% of countries uh, that we surveyed allowed, uh, had no specific time limit on how long extensions could be granted for. So um, that was a very concerning finding that we saw. So if we go ahead and go to the next slide, Beth, uh, a couple of the key conclusions then from this survey of countries' uh, statutory limits was first, again, that this is clearly a global problem, that it's not concentrated in any one region or any one legal tradition, um, that it's something that needs to be addressed on a, on a global level. Second, that there are a significant number of countries that either lack limits, 26% uh, of countries who surveyed had no specific time limit at all, and 40% of the countries allowed uh, extensions without any specific time limit. Uh, third, it was seemed clear that child-specific or child-specific limits or laws provided stronger protections for children. And finally, that by allowing some limited, well-defined exceptions is one way that countries seem to be trying to balance some of those competing concerns um, that Yannick was discussing. So some of the recommendations that come out of this then from the, from the study are first that Statutory limits should be strict. There should be a clear limit, and that's a recommendation, obviously not just from us, but it's coming from the Committee on the Rights of the Child as well. Uh, but also that if their countries are going to have accept exceptions or have extensions, that those should be limited as well and be well-defined. Uh, second, that courts need to enforce these limits, that the limits don't have much uh, power if, country, if courts aren't actually releasing children once they reach that maximum uh, time limit. Third is that, is that pretrial detention cases or children who are in pretrial detention, their cases ought to be prioritized in all of those different stakeholders' agencies. So in the court, in, the, in their calendaring process, in the prosecutor's office, in the public defender's office, um, in, in the forensics uh, or evidence offices, children who are in pretrial detention, their cases ought to be prioritized. Next is that alternatives can reduce some of that caseload uh, pressure on the courts. Um, so the, there's becoming a more wide acceptance of alternative measures, uh, diversionary measures, that that can have a positive impact, but if those aren't applied in a timely, me in a timely uh, manner as well, that that can have limited effectiveness. Fifth is that in this timely first appearance before a judge is really critical. Yannick explained that the recommendation is 24 hours, um, but that that really needs to take place within that 24 hour period in order for the rest of the process to continue and to ensure that, that those rights are being respected. Uh, Sixth is, is that countries need to have their juvenile justice systems receive adequate resources to deal with things like uh, case backlogs, case uh, load issues. 
And finally, um, trying children in adult courts, the, the study revealed, which isn't particularly surprising, but countries that allow children to be tried in adult courts, or that are tried as adults, or even if they're tried under the juvenile system, but they're tried in adult um, courts, that those time limits seem to not be uh, respected, or in some cases there aren't any time limits at all. So it's really critical to have juvenile-specific courts and, or, and the children be tried in the juvenile justice system. The, um, as I noted, uh, additional research that we would like to see take place as a result of this, and we're hoping to see some of that data included in the United Nations Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty. We we're looking at how long children actually are spending in pretrial detention, and if countries are actually enforcing the time limits that their statutes, um, that their statutes require. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Bart and then to Amy to discuss some of the specific uh, case, uh, case studies that, that they've had experience with. Thanks, Doug. Um, in the United States, uh, we've been fortunate that there's been a vibrant juvenile detention reform movement that has uh, sought to safely reduce reliance on secure detention. We don't have time this morning to go into all details about that large national initiative, but all of our guests um, who are not are uh, aware of this are encouraged to join JDAI Connect, which is an online platform developed and managed by the Pretrial Justice Institute, which will provide uh, ample information about the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, including this specific issue about um, case processing times. All you need to do is enter JDAI Connect dot org into your browser and it will provide you with directions for how to get uh, uh, registered for the site and therefore have access to um, all of its um, uh, resources. Um, so over the course of the 25 years that we've been doing the Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, and that now includes more than 300 separate jurisdictions, we've been surprised by the lack of attention that's been paid to reducing lengths of stay in pretrial detention, even though reducing length of stay could dramatically reduce detention population levels. Next, Beth, uh, next uh, uh, slide, please, Beth. Now, the relationship between how many youth we have in detention on any given day and length of stay is reflected in this fundamental equation that would be how you compute an average daily population. And as you can see from this, from this equation, a jurisdiction could continue to admit as many youth as it has traditionally admitted to detention but could lower the number of youth who are in detention on any given day simply by attending to this issue of their length of stay in pretrial in pre custody. Data from hundreds of our sites have revealed that there's a large number of very short-term admission to detentions that tend to occupy a minor number of bed days on any given day, um, but that there's a smaller percentage of cases whose cases remain in secure detention for lengthy periods of time and uh, who therefore tend to occupy a disproportionate number of beds. Amy's presentation in a minute will make this, uh, this relationship even more clear. But the point is that if sites could focus more effectively on long-term detainees, they could have a really profound impact on reducing detention populations. Now, the United States, uh, virtually every state, uh, has uh, case processing standards for juvenile court cases, um, and there are also national standards created by um, uh, a variety of professional associations, including the American Bar Association and um, the National Center for State, state Courts. Those standards, by the way, are available um, on JDAI Connect. Uh, next slide, please, Beth. Some of our states, actually, the, let me give you the next slide after that. Um, some of our states have very rigorous case processing standards for juveniles. So this particular graphic shows the case processing standards for the state of California for youth in detention. And as you can see, cases are expected to move very expeditiously. 
expect to have a, a, a petition filed within 48 hours, a detention hearing within the next day, 15 days from the detention hearing to the actual adjudicatory or trial, and then 10 days following an adjudication until a disposition. So that basically means from the time of first appearance in court to detention hearing through the disposition, California expects juvenile cases to be handled and resolved in 25 days. And my experience in California courts is that they're pretty effective in meeting those timelines. Now, for those of you looking at this graphic and wondering what this DER stuff is, let me quickly say without going it into detail, in this particular jurisdiction, they noticed that there were a large number of youth who were being released at approximately 25 days. So they were being held for their adjudicatory hearing and for dispositional hearing and then being released, similar to the phenomenon that Yannick and Doug have, have both described. The question that the stakeholders asked is, what's sacred or holy about that 25 day period? That is, if these cases typically can get resolved in that time frame, is there anything that we could do to resolve the cases even more quickly, even despite the, the, the rigor of those case processing standards, and they implemented something that they called detention at early resolution that involved a variety of steps that you could read about um, in the Timely Justice Practice Guide um, that enabled them to resolve a majority of their cases in even fewer than 25 days. Now, the standards that exist in the US generally meet the standards that Yannick talked about um, that the Convention on the Rights of the Child would, would require. But I think it's important for the audience to recognize that there are um, two basic problems with standards that we need to address and that go to an issue that Yannick will bring up in a moment in a concept that he's developed uh, called law in practice. The first is that courts generally tend to view the standards which set the outlaw outside limits of the time frames that courts may use, they view them as the norm rather than the outside limit. So we tend to think if the time from arrest to adjudicatory hearing is 30 days, that we have to hit the 30 day mark rather than ask the question, why not have the adjudicatory hearing within 15 days? The second problem with, the, with these standards, whether they're national, state, or international, is that there's very little accountability for abiding by them. And as uh, Doug indicated, in many instances, there are either sufficient exceptions to let the standards go by the waysides, or there are no consequences. For example, in many states in the US, if the court doesn't meet the standard regarding case processing times, that doesn't mean that the liberty interests of the youth then kick in and they have to be released from detention. Um, about two years ago, uh, uh, we decided uh, that despite all the uh, efforts in JDAI sites nationally, insufficient effort hadn't been made uh, regarding um, uh, case processing. Beth, go back one slide. Um, and so we produced a what we call a practice guide that was intended to increase the focus of these 300 sites on what they could do to identify both points in case processing where there was unnecessary or inappropriate delays, how they could identify those sites, what possible solutions there might be to the dilemmas that they were confronting. For our audience, this practice guide is available on JDAI Connect and you can down, download it uh, there. Um, uh, right now, I want to turn this over to my colleague, Amy, to talk about how her particular jurisdiction applied the techniques and the lessons in that practice guide, as well as discussions across JDAI sites in her jurisdiction, which is Shelby County in Tennessee. Thanks, Bart. Um, <clears throat> my name is Amy Bergdorf. I am the uh, data analyst and research specialist at the Juvenile Court in Memphis and Shelby County. Um, we 
undertook a analysis of case processing times by first examining detention admissions by length of stay. Um, can you go to the next slide, Beth? Thank you. So this is what we, this was uh, based on 2016 data. Um, the analysis kind of confirmed what Bart's already said. We, we had a lot of kids that were coming in and staying for a very short period of time, but the kids that were um, here longer, uh, that's a much smaller amount, but they're here for a good bit of time. Um, so we dug into our data a little bit further to see if we could determine why these long-termers were taking so long to get their cases resolved. Um, we were able to identify the types of cases that were particularly likely to have long lengths of stay. Beth, next slide, please. So what we looked at was cases in which psychological evaluations were ordered. So the graph here shows um, all the way on the left is all of the cases, the mean and median times versus kids that had a psych evaluation um, and kids that did not have a psych evaluation requested. So those kids that have the psych evaluation requested, the, the state of Tennessee gives a minimum of 30 days from the time that that psychological is requested for the uh, for, for it to be done. Normally it doesn't take 30 days, it takes longer. Um, so that's kind of what, what's bumping our number up there uh, from 61 for all of the kids to 123 for kids with psych evals. Uh, so that's, that's one of the things that, that we found like that was part of our, our issue. Next slide, Beth. Thank you. The other thing we looked at was <clears throat> Case processing times for kids that had motions for discovery. Um, motions for discovery are interesting in, in Tennessee because <clears throat> when, we, when, when the prosecution is seeking to transfer a child to the adult system, they have to file a notice of transfer. Uh, the transfer hearing has to take place at, at juvenile court. But the transfer hearing is simply a probable cause hearing. It is not a determination of guilt or innocence. And therefore, we have limited discovery available to the defense. Um, the defense doesn't necessarily like that very often, so they file motions for discovery uh, on a pretty regular basis. Um, motions for discovery and, well, I'm sorry, kids that, kids that are being uh, asked to be transferred are serious seriousness of offense or the age of the child um, or a combination of the two. So you can kind of see that for all of the kids, we were at 61.84 and then kids that were filed with motions or discovery filed were, was up to 85.56. So a little bit of a jump there when you have motions of discovery filed. Next slide, Beth. Okay, then we also looked at kids with transfer hearings versus kids without transfer hearings. And as you can see, the kids with the transfer hearings are staying a lot longer than the average, uh, than the average child, uh, about 40 days longer on average. Um, that has to do a lot with the psychological evaluation. Um, it also has to do with uh, motions of discovery being filed, continuances for numerous reasons. A lot of the time it's continuance for uh, the psychological exam to come back. Uh, they haven't received it yet. So um, we, in doing this analysis, go ahead Beth and go to the next slide please. In doing this, what we, what we did was we were able to work with our, some of our stakeholders to discuss the options that might help us reduce the length of stay for these types of cases. So we've worked with local police agencies to help emphasize the importance of writing summonses over arrest. We have a, a call-in program where the law enforcement official can call our detention center and request that a detention assessment tool um, scoring sheet be done on the child to determine whether or not that child would actually stay in detention or not. If that child would not stay in detention based on his score, then the officer has the option to go ahead and just write the summons. Um, we're also looking at local agencies to increase our respite care options. A lot of the Tennessee statute says that if there's a domestic, domestic assault or domestic violence call, that somebody is being taken away from the scene. A lot of the time, be, if it's between a parent and a child, the child is the one that is taken from the scene. Um, we're looking into, we've got two different places right now. 
that we have respite care options with. We are in the process of opening, juvenile court is not in the process, but the city of, of Memphis is in, in the process of opening a uh, juvenile assessment center, so hopefully we'll be able to utilize that as part of our respite care option. We've also had some discussion with the magistrates on using specific judicial tools for pre-adjudication, so not keeping kids in the system, but putting them, uh, releasing them on electronic monitoring. Uh, that's gone very, very well and has helped us decrease our population that's been uh, in detention for short periods of time. We also created an expediter position uh, as a recommendation to help decrease uh, processing time. Um, Ms. Salters uh, looks at the population on a daily basis and researches the, the children and the options that we possibly have to get these kids out of detention uh, in an in a expediated way. There we go. Um, so we we did a pr we've done a presentation to magistrates and the judge and the judge on the findings to illustrate where our system is hiccuping and try to sort of sit sit around and brainstorm our potential remedies. Next slide, Beth. So this is 2017 days in detention. So you can see we went from 2016. We had I think it was 70 something that just stayed for a day. We dropped that down to 51. Um, and we dropped our two to three day stay down to 26. You can still see that we do have a spike about the 20 to 29 day period. We also had the same spike in 2016. Um, the, other, the other portion of it is that's when the kids start staying a little bit longer. Um, we still have kids that are here for longer periods of time, but they are, as you can see, less and less as time goes forward. Um, in the coming months, we're going to be diving deeper into these matters. We're focusing on continuing to do case processing studies. Uh, the 2017 data is just about done being analyzed. 2018 is being cleaned and 2019 data will be run shortly. So hopefully we will have a better analysis of uh, what we'll be able to see if what we have been doing has been working. Um, just in terms of days of detention, it seems like it is, but we'll see what the other ones, uh, what, what the other analysis provide for us. Um, that's, I think that's it for me. Oh, there we go, sorry. Thanks, Beth, I didn't I forgot about this one. Um, this is our comparison of the data, so it's a little easier to see uh, where we went from the orange is 2016 and the purple is 2017. So you can see kind of we had that spike in the 20 to 29 um, day range, but we decreased significantly in that one to two, uh, I'm sorry, one to five days, we decreased significantly. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, no, Bart, I'm going to turn it back over to Bart now, and if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, before moving on to the uh, Dutch case study, I just want to um, indicate that uh, over the course of doing JDAI for 25 years, we've identified a series of common case processing problems and solutions. Those are discussed in greater detail in the practice guide. Amy's already mentioned some of them. But a couple of point, things that I want to point out to our audience that I think are uh, really Im important. First of all, in looking at case processing for juvenile court cases, it is important to focus on case processing in non-custody cases as well as those that are in pretrial detention because it is often the case that courts let the cases that aren't in custody linger unnecessarily long and that puts youth at further risk of negative pretrial outcomes like missing a court date or being picked up on a new offense even though it might be minor. So don't let the non-custody cases fall out of your focus uh, simply because of your concern about the youth who are actually behind bars. Second, some very routine matters are important to pay attention to. We found in most sites that postponements, court postponements, sometimes referred to as adjournments or continuances, are often granted for questionable reasons or when they're granted, little attention is paid to how much time is necessary for the subsequent um, uh, hearing in order to address the reason for the adjournment. So even the commonplace issue about whether or not the court grants a motion 
uh, or request to postpone a hearing need to be scrutinized and there need to be standards and there needs to be rigor in figuring out the recalendering. As Amy indicated, cases are often delayed because of things like psych reports. However, we need to peel back the onion on, on concerns like this because while yes, it would take time to produce a psych report, in most jurisdictions, cases are adjourned for four to eight weeks to produce a, a psychological report when the actual labor that's involved in producing it probably takes one or two days. So the question remains, why do we have a 60-day adjournment when in fact we could produce um, the relevant uh, report in a more timely way? Um, the details behind this particular uh, uh, matrix can be found in the practice guide that I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure that many of your individual sites for our audience here have your own peculiar um, case processing dilemmas uh, to identify um, and to address. The bottom line, however, is that paying attention to case processing can have a huge effect on how many youth you're detaining and on the quality of justice in your jurisdiction. Now I want to turn this over to um, Yannick to talk about case processing issues in the Netherlands. Yes, uh, thanks Bart. Yes, and this is the final part of this uh, webinar. I would like to present some lessons learned from my uh, studies, um, uh, my, my research projects on pretrial detention of children in the Netherlands. Um, uh, first of all, next slide, uh, Beth. Um, first of all, I would like to emphasize that the Netherlands has been uh, per persistently criticized on uh, its, its use of pretrial attention of children. Um, in 2015, uh, the concluding observations of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, uh, the committee uh, notes with concern that high numbers of children are in pretrial attention in uh, judicial youth centers for lengthy periods of time. Um, well, the question is, it, it, are those concerns uh, legitimate? Are those justified? Um, Let's have a, a quick look uh, on, on, some, on some numbers. Uh, next slide, uh, Beth. Um, well, in the Netherlands, there are approximately 1.2 million uh, children in the age of 12 to uh, 17, so under 18, uh, living in the Netherlands at the moment. And the 12 to, to 17, uh, so under 18, those are the age limits of, of juvenile justice in the Netherlands. Out of this group of 1.2 million, uh, approximately uh, 28,500 uh, children have been questioned um, uh, by the police uh, because they are suspected uh, of having uh, committed a, a criminal offense. Um, out of these 28,500, approximately 1,000 children actually spent time in a youth custodial institution in 2017. At the same time, 80% of the children who have been detained on the 1st of January 2018 was pretrial de detainee. And the, the criticism is mainly focused on this very high proportion of uh, pretrial detainees among the total population of children who are deprived of liberty in the juvenile justice system. And if we look at the average length of pretrial detention, we see that 38 days was in 2017. Um, the, the average length. So the question is, is, the Dutch, is Dutch practice in compliance with international children's rights standards? Well, in my view, it's impossible to, to answer this question based only on general uh, numbers. So I think we should go beyond that and look at both law uh, in the books uh, and law in action. So how does uh, uh, pretrial attention decision-making actually uh, takes shape in practice. First of all, law in the books. If we look at law in the books, Dutch law, we see that Dutch law is largely in compliance with these international children's rights uh, standards on pretrial attention. Uh, no pretrial attention is allowed for minor offenses. Uh, the law contains the narrow grounds and time limits. Uh, there is a periodic review, automatic and on request. Uh, the presumption of innocence is embraced by, uh, by Dutch law. Uh, the, the child welfare workers are involved and there's a wide range of different alternatives or non-custodial measures available and according to the law uh, there is um, uh, an obligation for the judge to always consider whether alternatives uh, can be used. Next slide please. At Dutch practice we see a different picture. We see that Dutch practice is not so much in compliance with international children's rights standards. 
Over the past uh, six years, I've conducted two uh, big uh, research projects on uh, pretrial detention of children in the Netherlands, um, including uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, research. I conducted uh, 225 uh, observations at uh, juvenile pretrial uh, court hearings uh, across the Netherlands. Uh, I conducted interviews with uh, 71 uh, judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, and other uh, professionals in the field. Uh, and together with colleagues, we did a, a systematic uh, case uh, file study in which we studied 250 uh, juvenile court case files to see how uh, pretrial detention is applied in practice. Next slide, please. Um, I want to highlight two uh, key findings of these studies. First of all, what we found is a very strong correlation between the use of pretrial detention and the imposition of custodial sentence. Uh, controlling for several uh, variables, including the severity of the offense, uh, criminal record of, of the child, we found that pretrial uh, detainees, children in pretrial detention, are significantly more likely to receive a custodial sentence after conviction compared to children who do not spend time in pretrial detention. Moreover, we found a very strong correlation between the length of pretrial detention and the length of the custodial sentence. In most cases, um, it was exactly the same, which de facto means that the child already served his custodial sentence in pretrial detention. Well, one of the underlying causes uh, for this practice is the belief that pretrial detention is an effective early response. Uh, can I have the quote, please, uh, Beth? Um, one of the judges uh, told me this during an interview. She said, I truly believe in the principle that it is better to detain juveniles directly after they have committed an offense than to wait six months until the final conviction. That's not effective. The idea of early intervention is of particular importance when juveniles are concerned. Therefore, using pretrial attention for that purpose can be justified. However, next bullet, uh, Beth, obviously this practice violates the presumption of innocence. And this is not just a legal or theoretical concern, it's an actual concern. Our research shows that approximately one in 10 children who spend time in pretrial detention is eventually not convicted. So it's a true risk to use pretrial detention to anticipate the sentence. Next slide, uh, please. The second category of findings that I would like to highlight concern pretrial release decisions. Uh, what we did, we, we conducted multivariable regression analysis to find out which factors can be significantly related uh, to the outcomes of ju judges' decisions on pretrial release of, of children. And what we did, we took into account 28 different factors, including, again, severity of the offense, criminal records, uh, home situation, etc. And what we found is several significant factors, factors that that significantly relates to the judge's decisions on pretrial release. And what we found is that uh, children in, with a young age from 12 to 14 are in similar circumstances significantly more likely to be released from pretrial detention compared to children in the age of 15, 16, or 17, which kind of makes sense. However, more concerning, uh, what we also found is that children with a non-native Dutch background are in similar circumstances significantly uh, less likely to be released from pretrial detention compared to children with a native Dutch background. We also found that children with mild intellectual disability were in uh, similar circumstances significantly less likely to be released from pretrial detention compared to children who don't have an intellectual disability. We also found that children who were not going to school and did not have another daytime activity or in similar circumstances, significantly less likely to be released compared to children who were going to school. And finally, what we found is a very strong correlation between the advice of the Child Protection Agency and the actual decision for, of the judge on pretrial release. So in other words, if the Child Protection Agency advises the judge uh, to release a child, uh, it's significantly more likely that the, that the judge does so. In fact, the advisors of the Child Protection Agency largely explain the other significant factors. So in other words, it seems that the, the age, the non-Dutch background, uh, the, the intellectual uh, disability, and, and whether or not the child is going to school are factors that already play a role in the advice of the Child Protection Agency and therefore also in the judge's decision on pretrial release. And next slide, please. What this confirms is the idea, the theoretical notion that pretrial detention decision-making is a collective process. 
Obviously, it's ultimately the judge that makes the decision, but this decision is largely shaped by the interactions with the different other stakeholders who are involved, including the child protection agency, the youth probation officer, the defense lawyer, the prosecutor. Um, next slide, please, Ben. So I want to end uh, with, with four lessons learned from, from my studies. Um, lessons learned that, in my view, are relevant for uh, efforts to, to reduce the use of pretrial detention of children and to reduce the length of pretrial detention. And first of all, Mark already mentioned this, uh, it's very clear that law in the books and law in action are not necessarily the same. So, at, like in the Dutch example, legislation and services and policies are, are very important and they're there in the Netherlands, uh, they're present, but as such, that's not enough. Ultimately, effective implementation boils down to decision makers in practice. And it relates to my second uh, point, um, that in the Netherlands, uh, reform can only be successful if there is also a change in judicial culture, in perceptions. And I think uh, that, that we as uh, children's rights scholars, children's rights advocates, have an important responsibility to, to try to, to engage with the judiciary, with, with the stakeholders in the field, uh, through training, uh, through uh, empirical evidence and dialogue. Thirdly, I would like to, well, again, highlight pretrial attention decision-making is a collective process. My American colleagues also addressed this already. So if you want to reform this practice, comprehensive reform is required. Uh, all relevant stakeholders should be uh, involved. And finally, my final point, I would like to highlight the issue of disparities in decision-making over representation of certain groups in pretrial detention, like ethnic minority groups, like disabled uh, children, require specific attention. And uh, systematic data collection and monitoring is required in order to detect and address these disparities. And I know that, for example, the United States also faces this issue, but uh, at least they do have policies in place, uh, systematic da data collection in place, and this is different, for example, in the Netherlands. We don't have any policies addressing disparities in the use of pretrial attention uh, or systematic data collection. Uh, well, against this background, I recently started a research project to, to, to study this, to study how, uh, what the meaning of equality is in, in pretrial detention decision making, but also to what extent uh, reform efforts in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, are, are, are successful and can be used uh, for in, in other jurisdictions as well, because I think there is still world to win there. Back to you, Doug. Great. Well, thank you, Yannick, uh, Bart, and Amy. Uh, this has been, a, I think, a really great panel for this particular discussion. We're going to jump in and take our last few minutes here in the Q&A. Uh, we have some really good questions to share. The first question I want to, uh, I, I want to direct to, to Yannick. We had a question about and what the objective or purpose of, in general, of the detention of children, and specifically as it relates to pretrial detention, you know, as far as rehabilitation, retribution, what is the, how should we be justifying the use of detention of children in general and pretrial detention specifically? Yeah, yeah, well, formally, pretrial detention is meant to be a measure of coercion that can be imposed, for example, to prevent reoffending pending trial or to make sure that the child appears in court. Uh, however, <coughs> it is by some practitioners also perceived as a, a way of a successful or a, a possible effective uh, intervention for rehabilitation purposes. And I think obviously it's important that when children are detained, it's, impo it's important to, uh, to treat them as children, uh, to aim their treatment at successful rehabilitation and reintegration, but to see this as an objective as such for imposing pretrial attention as a judge, I think that's risky because then you see, then you might have uh, the, the situation that pretrial attention is used more and more and more because judges or other practitioners think that's in the child's best interest, and then you can have definitely a start increase in the use of pretrial attention because it's supposed to be justified for rehabilitation purposes. So I think we should be uh, careful with this. Perfect. It's a great point, um, especially keeping in mind the principle of the presumption of innocence when it's prior to adjudication. Yes. 
Um, so there's another there's another question that gets to the um, the lack of data, specifically looking at what African countries. I don't know if any of our panelists have um, experience there, but I think it would be good to have um, maybe Bart or, or Amy or both talk just about uh, the importance of data in your work um, specifically, and then maybe Yannick can comment on some of the efforts, some of the global efforts to collect better data on juvenile detention. Well, I'll start if that makes sense. Um, just a general observation. When we began JDAI back in 1992, one of the things that was most stunning was the disconnection between the perceptions of system stakeholders about who was in detention and who was actually in detention. So in most of the sites that we visited, everybody who was involved in the system believed that the vast majority of youth who were in confinement were youth who posed substantial public safety or flight risks. A careful look at the data, however, revealed a very different picture, with a majority of youth being charged with relatively minor offenses, and many of them being there because they angered or frustrated an adult much more than because they were um, a severe uh, public safety risk. It was only through consistent and timely data collection that we were able to convince stakeholders that th the picture of who was in detention was all wrong, that they were in fact detaining relatively low-risk youth for reasons unrelated to the purposes of detention that Yannick previously articulated. As the initiative we went, went on, we similarly found that people's lack of data around case processing caused them to be blind to the dynamics uh, around what was happening in their court system. So most sites tended to rely on a simple statistic for case processing time, which was average length of stay. But the distribution of cases in detention admissions by length of stay, as Amy's graph showed, is not a normal distribution. So average lengths of stay as the primary statistic masked the phenomenon of small numbers of cases staying for exceedingly long periods of time. In the US, for example, the average length of stay in detention is approximately 20 days across the country. But the problem with that statistic is that the overwhelming majority of uh, kids in that distribution are in and out of detention within five days. Um, uh, a relatively small percentage stay well beyond the 20-day limit or the 20 days that are implied by the average length of stay. So the bottom line is to really get a handle on detention utilization and to address the dichotomy that Yannick has so effectively posed between law on the books and law in action, we really need data that sheds a light on what's really happening. I'm not sure that I can follow that up, Bart. Um, the data that we have <clears throat> in Shelby County is actually very, very good. We, we've got an immense amount of data that I'm able to look at. Um, when we first undertook the case processing study, um, I kind of was flying by the seat of my pants. I didn't really necessarily know what to look for, what I was, I was trying to find out, but with uh, the help of Mark Solar, he kind of helped me provide some questions that we were looking for the answers for, which is how we, we figured out, okay, this is where our issues are. Um, because I've done it before, in looking at the 2017 data, some other additional questions have come up, uh, which we hope to address uh, when we get the final, we get the final anal uh, analysis done. But, um, as far as data goes, yeah, we are we are definitely at the forefront of, of the collection of data. We just didn't know what to do with it for a really long time, but um, now we do, so that's that's a good thing. The, shall I shall I respond? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, well, I, I I mean I I don't have a concrete solution on, on a lack of data uh, in a certain co uh, continent, of course, but I think it's good to emphasize, I'm not sure where it was already mentioned during this webinar, but there is currently an independent expert, a UN independent expert working on the global study on children deprived of liberty, and they had 
uh, well, data gathering uh, throughout the world, a lot of partners throughout the world, uh, also sessions also in Africa, uh, I know for a fact. Uh, so I'm very curious what they have found uh, on, on, on the African uh, continent. Uh, and the report is expected to be published, I think, in October 2019. <laughs> My colleague Chris has a little bit of these special types of cases with ethnic or racial minorities. Um, and other and other questions around what are some best practices. I would just mention as kind of a concluding comment, uh, it is through the through the data efforts that are and Amy and Yamik have undertaken in their respective jurisdictions, how important the data is, but the issue of case processing or reducing the length of stay for children in pretrial detention is a complicated issue. Um, and there's a lot of implementing a lot of different best practices can help get at the at a better solution. So whether it's alternative case resolution mechanisms like diversion or restorative justice to divert more kids out of the traditional justice system, using those under obviously appropriate um, appropriate principles under international law. Uh, things like having effective supervision, and Bart had mentioned making sure the kids who are on, on supervision uh, in their communities, that those cases aren't taking an enormous amount of time as well to resolve. And effective supervision is critical, and it's critical to build the trust of all of the stakeholders for kids who are on, on release uh, so that they trust the system is able to supervise them adequately when their cases are pending. But all of those things coming together, one of the questions was, is there a is there a best practice? Is there a jurisdiction we can look at around the world? Kind of implement all of these different pieces, and now we can look to. I think um, Bart and, and Amy can. Yeah, Connect can be a place where some of this discussion can can continue. But um, I think our based on the this is an area where everything is in the world. And I think that's really critical. So, first uh, webinar on the issue of the length of pretrial, child pretrial detention. And thank you, everybody, for participating. And look on your um, JDI Connect if you're on JDI Connect. And if you're uh, if you're not, we'll be looking in your email box, and we'll be sending out some additional information. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yannick, Mark, Amy, and thank you, uh, Beth, at the Pre-Trial Justice Institute for hosting us. And have a, have a great uh, Monday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.